Good morning, everyone. Uh, very pleased to open this uh, second day of the joint conference on fiscal and monetary policy global challenges and introduce uh, our key keynote speaker, Professor Ludwig Straub. As the program of the conference uh, demonstrates, uh, the interplay between fiscal and monetary policy is of great importance for policy making, and the more so for policy making in a monetary union. Monetary and fiscal policy interaction played an important role in the review of our monetary policy strategy in 2021, and is mentioned in each uh, ECB monetary policy statement. Economic and monetary union remains incomplete. A permanent EU central fiscal capacity is missing in the euro area, as you know perfectly. This and other missing elements on, in the EMU uh, architecture can expose the euro area to existential crisis, as the one we experienced a bit more than a decade ago. A comprehensive reform of the EU's economic governance framework was agreed earlier this year. And we have since then emphasized the importance of the consistent implementation of this new fiscal framework across member states and over time. The new framework builds on the, on the understanding that more country ownership and flexibility come together with a strengthened fiscal surveillance and enforcement procedures. Keeping a fine balance between the two components will be important for the effectiveness and credibility of the new rules and for achieving the objectives of sound and sustainable public finances. Beyond fiscal, for the whole EMU construction to work, structural policies need to address low growth prospects, improve productivity and Europe's supply capacity. Back to our conference today, we need a good understanding of all forces at play to support good monetary and economic policy making. High inflation, monetary policy tightening and high levels of public debt pose significant challenges to monetary and fiscal policies at global level in review over these two days. The work by Ludwig, professor at Harvard University, offers a number of contributions and analytical frameworks to study these issues of great relevance on both sides of the Atlantic in present times. Ludwig, the floor is yours. You have uh, one hour, almost one hour. Perfect, it's on now. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak here today. I'm honored to present in front of you all right now. My keynote address will be on the topic of fiscal and monetary policy with heterogeneous agents. It's a literature that's still young and that I've been fortunate to play an active role in. Now, this literature has focused on a set of models that are commonly known as heterogeneous agent New Keynesian or Hank models for, for short. And even to this day, even though we've been at it for a while now, Whenever I talk to people about Hank models, I still get the same questions. Let me tell you what those questions are. Does it really matter? Like, if you really think about it, do we really need heterogeneity of the rich kind that is in these models? Do we need it today? Do we need to understand things about the world today with these models? Isn't it a bit like a black box? You can kind of make up your results and nobody understands why they're there. But if I'm only interested in aggregates, not in inequality or the distribution, though they, those might be important objects, but if I'm at the central bank, maybe I only care about the aggregates. Do I need the model for that with a lot of heterogeneity? Aren't two agents enough? I mean, two agents, it's heterogeneous in a, in a certain way. And if I match my impulse responses, right, that I estimate in the data with a Hank model or a representative agent New Keynesian model or a rank model, they show me ex match exactly the same impulse response. Isn't that enough? Why, why do I have to go to Hank? So in my talk today, I'm going to try to answer those questions as I'll go through uh, my presentation. And hopefully by the end, you'll have answers to those questions uh, in hand. Needless to say, I do think Hank models are very important, and that's why I'm here today. So a bunch of these answers are, it does matter, and does make a difference. So I'm going to split my talk into four parts. In the first part, I'm going to introduce what you might call a simple or canonical Hank model. It's probably the simplest Hank model that you can introduce. And I'm going to do so in what I will call the sequence space, which is a very natural approach 
to these kinds of models, as you will hopefully be convinced uh, later on. Then I will use that model and take it on a ride. I'm going to start by talking about implications for fiscal policy, which I think is one of the key areas that Hank models help us understand. And one result that I would like to emphasize there is that Hank models will predict that fiscal stimulus can lead to persistent inflationary uh, booms, which is going to be very different from rank or two agent or tank models. Then I'm going to move on to monetary policy, and I'm going to highlight a particularly important role for investment in the transmission mechanism over and beyond the importance of investment in a representative agent model. And, we're going to and I'm going to highlight that if a central bank would like to cool down the economy by tightening, but investment is not responsive, then maybe there's not that big of an effect of the monetary tightening. And last but not least, I'm going to talk about global spillovers of policies, specifically fiscal policy. And here I'd like to emphasize that fiscal stimulus, just like it can cause persistent effects within an economy, it can have large and persistent spillovers across countries as well. That may help us understand why so many economies had to grapple with high inflation after the COVID uh, pandemic. Now, the astute observer in the audience might have noticed that the reason I picked these three topics is it felt like it matched the, the title of the conference. And so maybe you're gonna you know, take something out of this room uh, that, that, that you're interested in. I should say this is not all my own work. This is based on a joint agenda with Adrian O'Claire and Matt Wrongly and several fantastic co-authors. And I would just wanna highlight Rodolfo, who is sitting right here, who is at the ECB and building the state-of-the-art estimated tank models for the Euro area. Excellent. So let me give you the core idea of why Hank is going to be different from rank. In a representative agent model, you've all seen the famous three equations. There's a very strong channel that operates through interest rates to consumption. And a very weak channel that operates from income to consumption. And so it's really all about intertemporal substitution and what happens to the path of real interest rates that matters when you're thinking about what influences consumption. That's gonna be very, very different in a heterogeneous agent model. In fact, there, the Euler equation, the transmission mechanism from real rates to consumption will be broken for many agents. And instead, agents will be more likely to consume in a hand-to-mouth fashion. And so there's more of a transmission from income to consumption rather than real rates to consumption. And this will include past income received in the past why? Because um, these agents are going to have a buffer stock. And so if you give them a little more liquidity, they're going to slowly decumulate it over time. And that's going to give rise to, um, uh, to a lot of persistence in, uh, in impulse responses. OK, with that, I'm going to jump straight into the model. So I'm going to do this as follows. I'm going to summarize the key features of the representative agent model. And then I'm going to cross out the things we'll have to change to get to the simplest possible heterogeneous agent model. So we all know the textbook representative agent model has a household side with a representative agent, duh. It has fiscal policy, but it's kind of irrelevant because we don't care about who gets taxed or when people get taxed because of Ricardian equivalence. So we typically don't state that. We have a Taylor rule and we have a typically linear production side in the simplest models and sticky prices set by firms. Let me start crossing out things. For sure, the representative agent has to go. We want heterogeneous agents. And why are they going to be heterogeneous? Because they're going to be subject to different income realizations because of randomness in idiosyncratic income. We're going to also have to dispose with the Ricardian equivalence feature because in this model, there's going to be a boring constraint and households are not necessarily going to be Ricardian. So we're going to have to be a bit more explicit about fiscal policy in the model. I can keep the Taylor rule, but it turns out for expositional purposes, a very nice special case is what I'll call a real interest rate rule, which is going to be essentially a Taylor rule that has a coefficient of one unexpected inflation. And finally, I also don't have to change sticky prices necessarily, but as I'll hopefully convince you, it's cleaner to set and work with sticky wages said by workers or in the micro foundation I'm offering today by unions. That's going to be the model. 
going to have four pieces. I'm going to set everything up in an economy with perfect foresight or MIT shocks. Why am I doing that? It's going to be very natural to do so, and it's going to be without loss to first order. Any response to, say, a fiscal shock I'm going to characterize will be exactly the same as the impulse response that comes out of a model in which fiscal policy hits the economy with stochastic shocks that can be you know, positive or negative. That's known as certainty equivalence. Perfect. So let me jump straight into it. The main thing we need to change is we need to allow for heterogeneity on the household side. So I'm going to have a continuum of households labeled by I. Each household I is going to maximize the expected discounted value of flow utilities. Flow utility is over consumption and labor supply. And I'll explain in a second why there's no I subscript on labor supply. There's a standard budget constraint and a standard borrowing constraint. In the budget constraint, we have consumption and saving on the left-hand side. And we have financial income and labor income on the right-hand side of the budget constraint. Now, look at labor income there. This EIT is exactly going to be the source of heterogeneity. That's going to be an idiosyncratic productivity shifter that is uninsurable. And so households would like to prepare for those shocks by holding a buffer stock, a, a level of assets above the borrowing constraint, so that in case of a low E-realization, they don't have to draw down their consumption right away they can reduce their asset and you know, prop up their, their consumption in that event to smooth consumption more effectively. One minus tau here is the keep rate of a standard proportional income tax rate tau, and W and N are the real wage and labor supply. Now, if you stare at this problem for a living, which is a pretty good description of my life, then you see that the household problem really only depends on two aggregate sequences. It's going to depend on the sequence of interest rates, and it's going to depend on the sequence of after-tax income. And so if I tell households what these two sequences are of interest rates and after-tax incomes, they can kind of do what we learned to do in the first year of the PhD. They can do the Bellman equation, they can figure out what their optimal consumption policies are as a function of where they are in the income and asset distribution. With those policy functions, you can start from an initial wealth distribution, say a st steady state distribution, and start iterating it forward to see how the wealth, dist wealth distribution evolves over time. And then by combining those two, the policy and the distribution, you can figure out, for example, what happens to aggregate consumption. And so if you look at this, you notice that this is literally just a mapping from two deterministic sequences to yet another deterministic sequence, namely the sequence of aggregate consumption. So I can write this in some sense as a aggregate sequence space function. And I could call this the aggregate consumption function in the sequence space. And for those of you who are trained in sort of ISLM models, this is like a very complicated way of getting at a similar object, but an object that is dynamic and an object that is microfounded. And there's going to be a lot of parallels between this approach and the ISLM approach. And in fact, in some ways, these heterogeneous agent models are, I don't want to say natural successors, but they kind of are to the ISLM model more so than a representative agent model would be because of the importance of income effects in consumption. Let me move on to fiscal and monetary policy. Fiscal policy is going to be very simple. I'm going to need that the government specifies two sequences for government spending and for tax revenue. They're consistent with the standard government budget constraint and a bounded amount of debt. And that tax revenue is raised by the tax rate tau that I already mentioned. And finally, the central bank will set a, a rule for the nominal interest rate, which looks like a standard Taylor rule. I made a one you know, a sleight of hand there by introducing expected inflation in there. That's not going to be the key, key uh, uh, feature of this rule. The key simplification I'm going to make is I'm going to take fee towards one. Why? Because in that case, the real interest rate is basically exogenously determined by the steady state rate plus a monetary policy shock. Why am I doing that? Hopefully will be clear later on, but notice that the real rate is the the interaction is exactly at the interface between monetary policy and the real economy here. And so by allowing the central bank to directly control the real rate, 
I can basically directly allow it to control that interface. And I'm going to have to do less math in my slides today. You can do everything I do with a Taylor rule. It's just going to look a bit, little bit more complicated. Great. Finally, let me move on to the supply side. I'm going to have the same linear production function as a standard in representative agent models. Labor is converted into output goods with flexible prices. And so if you write down the profit maximization problem of a firm, you're going to see that it immediately implies that the nominal price is equal to the nominal wage or taking the ratio that the real wage is equal to one at all times. So that's not the source of nominal rigidity. What is, instead, I'm going to use this idea of going back to Ursek, Henderson, and Levine, that uh, there's a set of unions, and these unions bargain with firms over the nominal wage. And basically, you end up with a, a simple Phillips curve like that, where this term, this daunting term here, that's multiplying kappa, is the average labor wedge in the economy, right? And so if the average labor wedge here in this, in this notation is high, meaning people work too many hours, V prime, the disutility is very high, unions are going to go out to firms and try to negotiate higher nominal wages. Okay? These are not necessarily translating to higher real wages here because of perfect competition on the, in the product market, but they're still going to generate inflation. Now, one assumption I'll need to make here for this Phillips curve is how unions are changing hours of different members. In these simple representative agent model, when a union is faced with a higher labor demand, it just passes on that labor demand to workers who need to uh, supply more hours. In a heterogeneous agent model, I need to tell you who has to work more. And here, Excel presented a very nice paper, far too complicated for me here today, that uh, yesterday at this conference, that g gave you a nice way to think about who is more likely to you know, uh, spend more hours working when, say, in a boom, there's more labor demand. I'm going to make my life here very simple and just assume that everybody's hours go up and down in tandem, which I think is a, is a natural starting point for uh, this uh, model today. Finally, why am I doing sticky wages? Because if you're familiar with the traditional representative age in New Keynesian model, with only sticky prices and not sticky wages, so flexible wages, then in a boom, the price can't move, but the wage does because households are going to have to put in more hours. And so the wage goes up, the price remains relatively sticky. And so what that implies is that the markup gets uh, reduced dramatically in a, in a lot of specifications that will lead to counter-cyclical profits. And in a representative agent model, that's not a big problem because these counter-cyclical profits will be offset by very pro-cyclical real wages in that model because the wage rises so much and they're earned profits and wages by the same person in the representative agent model. So it doesn't make a difference. Here with heterogeneity, profits and wages do not necessarily go to the same people. And so you can have bizarre effects uh, in these uh, models if you're not careful. And so I'm gonna be shutting all of these discussions down by just focusing on flexible prices with sticky wages rather than the other way around. Perfect. Let me illustrate what this model does in a graph. You're going to see a bunch of these flow charts, and I think they're kind of useful. I remember, I think back in the 70s or 60s, there were a lot of these models represented as complicated flow charts with complicated you know, flow and stock equations. We're not quite there yet, but it has sort of a similar, similar spirit. So this is how the model works. Output is determined by consumption, and consumption is determined by the real interest rate, but there's a weak link there. And there's a strong link from anything that enters the household budget constraint as income, meaning tax revenue and aggregate output, which is earned as income. And then finally, there's government spending, which enters the uh, enters output directly. And so if you look at this uh, flow chart, you see there's a cycle there. And this cycle is going to be a fixed point. And if I write this fixed point in math, this is what it looks like. Output is determined as the sum of government spending and consumption. Where consumption, remember, followed this intertemporal, this aggregate consumption function in the sequence space, which takes in real interest rates and the sequence of after-tax income, which again, depends on Y, depends on aggregate output, and so there's a fixed point here. If I had allowed for a Taylor rule with a, uh, a coefficient on inflation bigger than one, you'd have a bunch more of these cycles. There's a bunch more feedback effects that are coming in because now the real rate is gonna be endogenous, 
I didn't want to deal with that for today, but you can do everything I'm doing with that model as well. Okay, that's the model. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and first shut down monetary policy shocks, which is to say I'm going to have a constant real interest rate path. But I'm going to allow G and T spending and tax revenue to move. Then I'm going to do the reverse. I'm going to allow R to move, and I'm going to try to keep fiscal policy as passive as possible. Okay, so imagine the central bank keeps the real rate constant, and I feed into the model a small first-order fiscal policy shock where, say, I'm going to increase government spending, and I'm going to increase tax revenue, and I want to make sure that they have the same net present value because otherwise the government budget constraint won't hold. So what happens to output in response? Let's write down our fixed point. You see output shows up on both sides. The natural way to approach this is, let's take a first order uh, Taylor expansion. If you do that, you see that you can write the change in output that we'd like to solve for as the direct spending shock that we feed in, plus a bunch of indirect effects that go through consumption, where consumption at day T might respond to uh, after tax income changes at any other point in time, I already mentioned it's not going to just be current income that matters for consumption. It could be yesterday's income. It could be expectations about future income. And in that income term at date S, you have again dy and tax revenue at date S. What are these derivatives there that I fleshed out? These are an interesting object that I'll call intertemporal MPCs because they naturally generalize the idea of an MPC. Right? The idea of an MPC is I give you an unanticipated increase in your income, and I see how much you spend right away today. These derivatives are a more complicated generalized object where maybe I'm not, I'm not just interested in how you spend today if I give you an unanticipated increase in income, but also how you're going to spend tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Or maybe I give you an income increase tomorrow, and I'm interested in how you spend today. There's a big matrix of cross partials that is relevant here. Now, if you're like me and you like linear algebra, then you're going to stack these equations and write them in vector form. So the impulse response of output can then be written as the exact shock process that you feed in, also a vector now, minus the response of consumption to tax increases, m times dt, where m is that matrix of intertemporal MPCs, plus sort of this Keynesian multiplier term where we multiply these intertemporal MPCs with the output response. That's exactly like in the textbook ISLM model, except that it's vector valued and that the MPC is no longer a number, but a big matrix because of all these dynamic uh, effects between periods. So we call this the intertemporal Keynes and Cross rather than the old Keynes and Cross, or as Paul Krugman likes to say, Paleo Keynes and Cross. So let me show you what this M encompasses um, next, just to give you a bit more intuition. It's a big matrix, as I mentioned. What is the first column of that matrix? Well, that's just the impulse response of aggregate consumption when I increase after-tax income today. The first element, M00, is the traditional MPC. And after that, it's all the delayed spending effects when I give households an additional dollar at date zero. The present value of that entire column has to be one because at some point they're going to spend the dollar that I give them. What's the second column here? Column one. Same idea. Now it's the impulse response to an anticipated increase in income tomorrow. When households anticipate higher income, they might spend more today, but they are also going to spend more in the future. And you can look at that entire column there. And the same is true for column two here. Now, what does this look like? or a representative agent. Everything I've done so far can do with a representative agent or with a two-agent model where there's some, uh, 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 in addition to a Ricardian agent, a hand-to-mouth agent. So for a representative agent, I can compute these derivatives, and this is what they're going to look like. First column, column zero, is going to have one minus betas, and it's going to be constant at one minus beta. Why? Because if I give a representative agent, a Ricardian agent, an additional dollar today, they're going to perfectly smooth it out over the entire infinite lifespan. And so they're only going to consume the annuity value, which is basically the interest rate, and one minus beta 
in the standard calibration is the interest rate. That's a small number. So these, this column is going to be very small and it's going to be flat. It's going to be constant. And the same is true for column one and column two, except that if I give them a transfer tomorrow by a dollar, in present value terms, that's worth a bit less. That's going to be worth beta today. And that's why there's an additional beta. So let me plot these, these first columns of different models and compare them to what we know about what that first column looks like in the data. Here, the black dots are data from a very nice paper by Fagering, Holm, and Natvik, who in Norway tried to measure these intertemporal MPCs by looking how people respond to modest lottery winnings, not just today, but also over time. They track people over time. And then in blue, a sort of standard calibration of a heterogeneous agent economy. And what you see is that these heterogeneous agent models can match a high standard you know, impact MPC, the first point here, but they can also match the slow spending down of an additional dollar of earnings over time. And the reason they can do that is because they don't have people all sitting at the boring constraint with a, you know, a, a, an MPC of one or far away from the boring constraint with an MPC of zero because there are some people that are sort of in between the two extremes and they have a planning horizon that's not you know, one period only, but it's gonna be modest over a couple of periods over which they, they're trying to insure against income risk, and that gives rise to these uh, delayed spending effects. So how does this compare to alternatives? In red here on the right, you see what happens in a representative agent model. And already mentioned, right, the spending response is small and flat here because households in a representative agent model do perfect consumption smoothing and they only consume the annuity value. And in a two-agent model where I pair a Ricardian agent with a hand-to-mouth agent, that does generate on impact a large spending response because the hand-to-mouth agent will get part of the income transfer. But once that agent spent, nobody else is interested in spending anything anytime soon. And so we drop even below the representative agent line at year one. And so this is not really consistent with uh, the evidence. What does this imply? in practice, does this matter for anything? So let me do the following experiment. Went and looked up the US primary deficit, which is not a fun activity to do. And then I took the deviation of the deficit relative to trend, which was around 2% before, um, before COVID. And then I looked by how much the surplus fell or the deficit increased relative to that trend. And I said, maybe about 70% is going to household. And I take it all the way to the current year, and then I assume something prudent is going to happen, which may not be happening in reality. But let's say, let's, in the positive scenario, we actually do consolidate later on, and we raise taxes and pay back some of the debt that was issued. If I feed this in as my DT, my change in tax revenue, into the model, into, in fact, all three models, heterogeneous agents, representative agent, two agent, this is what I find for consumption. I find that consumption goes up very strongly and very persistently in a heterogeneous agent model. And in fact, it never goes below zero, even though later on taxes are increased. Compare that to a two agent model where you do get a modest increase in consumption in the initial periods, but then as soon as the, the fiscal authority, the treasury raises taxes, that's out the window, and in fact, we get a reduction in consumption. Why? Because in the two-agent model, the only thing that matters for consumption is cur the current deficit, the current transfer or tax cut, not what happened in the past or in the future, because these intertemporal MPCs only load on current transfers, not unanticipated or past transfers. If I plot inflation, according to a simple Phillips curve, you see that inflation goes up very strongly with a lot of inertia in the heterogeneous agent economy, whereas in the representative agent model, you see nothing because it's Ricardian, and the two agent model, you see just a small increase in inflation. So I think this is useful to keep in mind when we stimulate the economy, because we want to make sure that we don't overstimulate them and then have to sort of uh, um, pay the cost for that down the road with long and persistent inflation that supports consumer demand for way beyond the recession. 
Let me give you a simple illustration, just sort of an MBA style of why they're so much persistent. Okay, imagine my economy has three groups of people. The poor and the middle class, well, say, are maybe, you know, more likely to be hand to mouth. They have an MPC close to one. There's sort of the upper middle class that maybe has an MPC of, you know, 50%, 40%, something meaningful, but not one. And then there's the top 1% that, let's say, has an MPC of zero. And imagine the government goes out and gives liquidity, gives transfers to the poor and the middle class. Well, they have an MPC of close to one, they're going to start spending it. And a lot of observers initially were computing sort of the, the, um, the, the, the sluggishness or the, uh, the effects of, of this increase in liquidity in the US economy in, by assuming that once somebody spends it, the money is gone and it was spent and then we've run down excess savings that come as a result of those transfers. But that's not true, right? Because if these people spend, somebody else is gonna earn it. Someone's spending is somebody else's income and so who's gonna earn it? Let's say the poor and middle class uh, earn it and the upper middle class earn it. Well, the poor and middle class, they're gonna spend again, but the upper middle class is not, right? They're gonna delay their spending somewhat. And so they're gonna save a little bit, spend some more tomorrow. Maybe they're saving for a larger purchase in the future, et cetera. At some point they're gonna spend, part of that income again will go either to the poor and middle class or through the upper middle class. And at some point you're gonna get some leakage to the top 1%. And that's where the, party, so to speak, ends because they're not going to spend out of additional income. And so this process keeps on going up until this increase in liquidity or these excess savings, as they're sometimes called, have traveled from the poor who were originally the targets of that uh, uh, liquidity all the way to the rich. And that's when we have no more impact. Monetary policy can accelerate this reallocation. But that always has to happen before everything, uh, before this, uh, uh, um, this the positive consumption effect of these transfers stop. Perfect. So let me move on to monetary policy. Now I'm going to do the flip side of what, what I was just doing. I'm going to say, assume the central bank does move the real interest rate and assume that the government tries to be very passive. And there's many ways of assuming different fiscal rules. I'm gonna do something very simple and I think uh, intuitive. I'm gonna assume that when the interest rate falls, for example, which means that for any given debt repayment in the future, the government now gets more money, that gets more resources. I'm gonna assume that, that it takes that, those resources coming from lower interest rates and reduces taxes in the period in which that windfall occurs. Okay, so I'm gonna again have to solve that fixed point on the left there, where now government spending is gonna be constant, R will be the shock, and T will move as a response to the change in interest. Then I follow the same steps as before, and I again get a vector valued sequence space equation that tells me what the output response is, to a monetary policy shock. So that has three components. Let me walk you through them. The first component is the direct effect of a real interest rate change, right? That's the direct effect through the Euler equation and through any asset positions households hold. And households are gonna to respond to that, but they're gonna respond less to that in a heterogeneous agent economy because their households are gonna be less likely to be on their Euler equation due to income risk and due to uh, a borrowing constraint. There's also an effect here that comes, an indirect effect that comes through the government budget constraint because now tax revenue falls as the central bank stimulates the economy. And that supports an increase in uh, consumption. And finally, we have the same kind of Keynesian multiplier effect that we had before, where any endogenous increase in output feeds back into income, feeds back into aggregate consumption. So as I mentioned, the key channel with a representative agent, in fact, almost the only channel active is the channel through the other equation. That's the direct channel here. These indirect channels are not key for a representative agent, are, but are gonna be crucial for a heterogeneous agent economy. And that was first noted by this famous paper by Kaplan, Moll, and Bueller. Okay. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna feed in 
monetary easing as a shock into a representative and a heterogeneous agent economy, and we're just going to compare and see what they look like. So this is my shock on the left, and on the right, this is what I see as the aggregate output responses in the three economies. And you might be surprised by how darn close they are. Heterogeneous agent models predict the exact same boom, almost to the decimal, than a representative agent or a two-agent model. So that's surprising. They have different channels that are active. One has an Euler equation that is very active, one doesn't. How is that, how is that possible? Well, if we decompose these responses on the left for a representative agent, on the right for a heterogeneous agent economy, into their direct and indirect effects, you see what's going on is in the representative agent model, the direct effect is absolutely crucial for the transmission. And in the heterogeneous agent economy, it's mostly about the indirect effects. And it's going to be mostly about the Keynesian multiplier effect. So that's interesting. They exactly offset each other. If I show this in a flow chart, this is what's going on. In rank, we have direct transmission from real rates to consumption. And then there's a very light amplification that goes on between consumption and income. Whereas in a heterogeneous agent economy, there's a very light direct transmission from real rates to consumption and a strong indirect amplification channel. But if you look at this, this makes you, and you, you put on your ISLM hat, this kind of makes you wonder, well, aren't we missing an important part of monetary transmission? In reality, we don't think everybody's on their other equation all the time, but we do think there's other things in the economy, such as investment, that are very or more responsive to interest rates than consumption is. So if you add investment to a representative agent model, it's just going to be an additional line. There's not really much feedback from adding investment to consumption. Because as I said, there's not really much feedback from stimulating output more back into consumption because income effects are small in the representative agent. But in our heterogeneous agent economy, that's going to be very different. So if you add investment there, you're sort of setting in motion that multiplier effect. And that applies now to a strong investment response, not a very soft you know, intertemporal substitution response of households. Now, one thing you could say is, well, I see what the output response to monetary policy is in the data. I mean, if I match that with a rank and a hank model, they're bound to give me the same. So why do I care about you know, how strong investment is? Let me try to convince you that it matters even if you estimate these models to match the same output responses. So this is what we did in a paper where we estimate impulse responses like in Cristiano Eichenbaum Evans in a heterogeneous agent and then later also in a representative agent model. And then we look at what happens when you assume as a counterfactual that investment is not active in the transmission mechanism. And you see that once I take the estimated you know, solid lines here, and I take out the investment response, well, naturally output falls because investment is a part of, of GDP, but it falls by more than its direct contribution to GDP, precisely because as investment is less responsive, now, the loss of income for households matters for their spending. And you see on the right that now consumption is also going to be much less responsive to monetary policy. It's not just investment or output as I take out investment or assume that that channel is inactive. Let me compare that with a representative agent model. In that model, I estimate the model to the exact same impulse responses. So the solid lines look kind of similar. But as I assume that investment is unresponsive for some reason, in output, I get a much smaller effect, uh, a smaller reduction, because consumption doesn't fall. The transmission through consumption in a representative agent model is entirely or almost entirely independent of uh, that through investment. Now, why do I think that this matters potentially in the current economy? Well, imagine you want to tame inflation because the labor market is hot, consumer spending is still going strong. Imagine you're in the US. You want to tighten monetary policy. Well, what this tells you is that for, if for some reason investment isn't coming down, 
And I think if you ask me, the main piece here, the main piece of investment that responds is residential investment. So if residential investment is not coming down and maybe house prices aren't coming down, you may not have a huge effect on output because maybe you're lacking the main transmission mechanism of monetary policy into output also via consumption. And it might also tell you that if at the same time as you're tightening, fiscal policy runs programs that explicitly stimulate investment, such as the CHIPS Act or the Inve Inflation Reduction Act, then you're not just going to have headwinds because investment is stimulated, but you're also going to be get headwinds, headwinds because consumption will be increasing as a result of that stimulus to investment. Perfect. My last few minutes, I'm going to turn to a global perspective. So now consider a world economy with N countries, large countries. It's not going to be a small open economy world. And assume that each is home to exactly the same kind of heterogeneous households that I've been analyzing in a closed economy context, except that, let's say, average productivities differ across countries because some countries have a higher GDP per capita, others have a lower GDP per capita. But otherwise, they're going to have the same NPCs or intertemporal NPCs. Assume that I have an Armington-like trade network in place where I look at trade data and see where, say, US consumers consume around the world. And I I'm going to denote the fraction of country I spending going to country J by some AIJ. Assume that each country runs a fiscal policy, dynamic fiscal policy consisting of a path of G and a path of tax revenue, subject to country I's government budget constraint. And let me assume the government spending is only on domestically produced goods. And let me stick with that monetary policy rule that assumes that the central bank in all countries stabilizes the real rate. This is just going to make my life very simple. Again, you can relax that. Why is this going to make my life simple? Because it'll, it'll imply that the real exchange rate is going to be constant because real rates are going to be held constant in the transition. Now consider, again, small shocks to government spending and tax revenue in each economy then I can write down sort of a world you know, equivalent to my intertemporal Keynesian cross. And that's going to be very closely related to the paper that Laura presented yesterday, where she did it in a small open economy context. This is sort of a large world, uh, world economy context. So now what I want to solve to analyze spillovers across countries is not just the output or the consumption or the inflation response in one country, but I want to solve it in all countries, which is pretty darn difficult because you're not you know, using efficient methods. Even a closed economy impulse response in heterogeneous agent models is hard to compute. But this is even harder, especially if I want to do this for pretty much all countries I can get, hands on, uh, get, get my hands on data for, 177. And this is like inverting a, a you know, 55,000 by 55,000 dimensional matrix with 3 billion entries, OK? We have new methods that, that uh, go beyond the methods that we've already put out to solve closed economy heterogeneous agent models that even allow you to do this in, in no time at all. Everything I'm showing you, I computed yesterday on my laptop in a couple of seconds. So no cluster, nothing. Let me show you what I find, OK? I'm feeding in the same fiscal shock as before, just to the US economy. So I'm assuming that no other country did any fiscal stimulus, just the US did. This is the output response in the US economy I'm finding now. It's a bit smaller than the one I, I showed you before. Why? Because there's some leakage to the rest of the world, right? That fiscal uh, stimulus sort of leaks to the rest of the world at a certain speed. But what that implies is that the rest of the world also gets some part of that stimulus. And if you look at some of the other countries, Mexico, Canada, that are direct neighbors of the US and are relatively small relative to their trade with the US, you see that output increases quite uh, uh, significantly in those economies. You also see that China and Germany as other trade partners, but that are larger in and of themselves, also have see meaningful effects in aggregate demand. But one thing that I want to highlight is you get the exact same thing for inflation. You have significant spillovers of inflation from the US 
to the neighboring countries and also to countries around the world like uh, China and Germany. Although if you look at these plots with a bunch of delay, and I think that's quite, quite interesting. The US is in fact here in both plots, the first country that sees a cool down in the economy as my presumed you know, fiscal consolidation kicks in and you see a cool down in inflation that is faster than in other economies. Because as Americans spend on the rest of the world, they basically carry liquidity out of the country and then it starts sort of slushing around in the rest of the world and increasing demand and inflation in the rest of the world up until, again, it ends up in the hands of rich people anywhere on the planet who stop this spiral, as I explained before. I can also show you wonderful maps about how, over time, you first on impact, see how the US economy and its neighbors are affected the most, and then we spread that transfer around, and then the US economy is the first one to hit, get, uh, uh, see a cool down once we have fiscal consolidation, and then slowly it spreads to the rest of the world. Don't ask me why some of these countries are showing up red. I'm just taking the trade data, but that's what comes out, which I think is kind of interesting. All right, let me conclude. Tank models imply crucially that consumption depends more on income, including past income, than interest rates. And I think it's very natural to organize and analyze Hank models in the sequence space because it's not a black box approach. You see exactly what goes into the model. There's, for example, a crucial intertemporal MPC matrix. You can look exactly at what it looks like and see if you're happy with that matrix or not. And, and there's no sort of, you know, massive machinery that you don't know how it operates. I presented three main lessons. First, that a deficit financed fiscal stimulus can have persistent effects on economic activity and inflation. That monetary policy mostly only works if investment responds. If it doesn't respond, maybe we need to think about why it doesn't and, and help that. And third, that global spillovers are large and can have persistent effects or slow to die out in the world economy. Overall, I think this is a very fascinating and, and, and active literature with a lot of work to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ludwig. Uh, you have adjusted perfectly, uh, even a little bit shorter uh, than the 60 minutes that you had. Right. But so <laughs> we are going to have more time for the Q&A. So, you know, we are going to, Olivier, we are going to collect two or three questions and then you can, you can respond. Olivier. I think that uh, you will have a microphone there. This was, this was great. I, I had many questions. I'll limit to three short ones. The M is actually not constant. It depends on the initial distribution. So the question is, is there enough movement in actual distributions over time that there are times where might we pass is going to work less or more? The second is you focused on policy, but this also raises the question of shocks. So, for example, when we want to increase consumption, we do discount rate shocks, which are not terribly plausible, but that creates many other sources of shocks. And then the last one is heterogeneity of firms, as opposed to heterogeneity of, of people. And it seems to me that there might be just as much mileage from doing that. Well, you can respond because uh, Olivier has posed uh, three questions, so <laughs> we, can, we can, you know, we have the first call. There we go. Well, thank you very much for those questions, Olivier. Um, all excellent questions. So the M is absolutely not constant, and it does depend on the wealth distribution. I think, for example, there are large differences across countries in the wealth distribution and in the M's that are present. But I also think that over business cycles, you could have differences in wealth in the wealth distribution and differences in MPCs. Um, so, for example, you could have you know shocks that predominantly hit you know the poor part of the wealth distribution. In which case that will send more households to or close to the borrowing constraint. And that means that policies like fiscal stimulus or monetary policy are more effective in that world than they otherwise would be. So I absolutely agree. When I look at first order linearization, those effects won't be there because the MPC itself is already a derivative. 
But once you go to higher orders, those effects can absolutely be there. Once you have large shocks, think of COVID as a large shock. I'm pretty sure, for example, that by having huge fiscal stimulus in the US, we probably diminished MPCs to some extent. And the, you know, the, the marginal dollar that was spent probably was you know, multiplied with a smaller Keynesian multiplier than, than the first dollar that was spent. So I absolutely agree that that is an important margin to think about. I agree with uh, the beta shocks case that you mentioned. Beta shocks are going to be amplified in exactly the same way. You're just going to have that with, say, a, an increase in the discount factor, an increase in beta. As people draw down their spending, um, you're going to have the same you know, Keynesian cross amplification mechanism because that initial reduction in spending is going to translate into a reduction in income, which is going to translate into f further reductions in consumption, and so on and so forth. That is exactly as powerful as, as a transfer shock would be. Um, and finally, on heterogeneous firms, I couldn't agree more that we think that heterogeneous firms, for anyone who is interested in this literature, I think are a vast, you know, underexplored space. There's a few work there, a, 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 few, um, a, a few excellent papers there, but I think there's a lot more to be understood, especially on, you know, balance sheet constraints that these firms might face, in which case they could also be subject to sort of NPCs or marginal propensities to invest, just like households are um, in, in, in this model. Um, and that's partly why I think if you're thinking about investment as a transmission mechanism to monetary policy, if in fact it is the case that a large uh, subset of firms are sort of more likely to be hand to mouth, that the main transmission channel is not that these firms that are more like, like, uh, likely to be hand to mouth are responsive to, to real rates directly. It is in fact, that, that's where this was coming from, uh, I think residential investment that is more responsive, and then that kickstarts both consumption and investment of balance sheet constrained firms. But I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So fascinating uh, keynote. Thank you, Ludwig. Uh, one comment and two short questions. Uh, when I listened to you, I was reminded of this paper by Chris Carroll along uh, many years ago. It's called Death to the Eller Equation. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that kind of summarizes the, the research agenda a little bit. Uh, there, is a, there is a parallel in the, in the asset pricing literature, I think, which has been making progress also in moving away from the Euler equation um, and introducing intermediary asset pricing and limits to arbitrage. And I, I find it interesting that these are sort of the, uh, the most active parts of the um, sort of the modeling frontier. Uh, the two questions is, one is when I think about your M matrix, there is the, uh, I, I can, uh, and I think compared to the ISLM kind of world, it's about the off diagonal elements. And there is the upper uh, triangular part and there is a lower triangular part. Uh, the lower triangular part is about the fact that it may take a while for the shock to impact aggregate demand. And I think that's going to your point about the savings, excess saving trickling up to the 1%. And I have no problem with that. The upper triangular part is about expectation effects of income injections in the future. I'm much more concerned about you know how much we have on that. You know how much people respond to things that I mean. Of course, you're working with a perfect foresight model, but maybe that's that's a part where. And I, I'm kind of wondering if we should treat them differently. Uh, the the second uh, comment is on fiscal policy. What came from the results you showed us is the much larger fiscal multipliers in a sense. And, uh, and also sort of impact on inflation. Now we had Laura's paper yesterday, we had a very interesting discussion about what happens in the open economy. And I think her results, and we were trying to sort of uh, wrestle with that, one of her results was um, it's not clear that you have such a huge difference between Hank and other types of models once you're in the open economy. I wonder if you have some thoughts about this because that seemed, some of these differences you're highlighting seem to go away. Stop here, thanks. Great. Thank you for those questions. I um, love Chris Carroll's paper, so I agree. We should probably put the, put the Euler equation, at least in its pure form, in the representative agent model, um, a bit into the background. Um, I think the connection to intermediary asset pricing is very interesting. I know much less about that than many of you in the room, but I think it's a fascinating area for future research. There's a little bit of asset pricing that's starting to happen. I see Ralph somewhere in the room who has been doing some fascinating work in this area. Um, I just absolutely love the question on perfect foresight. 
And the reason I love this question so much is because if you think about this matrix exactly as you said, everything above the diagonal is captures consumption responses to income that's going to happen, that's going to hit households in the future. And so it's a, exactly a natural question, like, what if households are unaware that their income is going up in the future? Um, what if um, households are unaware that maybe taxes are going to change in the future? And I think that's a very plausible assumption. And the reason I love this question is because in this approach that I mentioned, it is very, very simple to move away from perfect foresight. And in fact, I could have done all my analysis in a world in which households are blissfully unaware of anything that happens uh, in the future. And the only thing I would have to change is I would have to take the first column, which is the response to an unanticipated increase in income, and copy it down along the diagonal and fill up the upper triangular part of the matrix with zeros. That's it. And then I have a world in which agents are fully myopic. Now, I can do intermediate cases too. I can do, you know, the Mancure Rice sticky information that's somewhere in between. I can have noisy signals, all sorts of funny things that, that all work here, but, but are very hard to do in, you know, a, an approach that doesn't operate in the sequence space, but operates in, in, a, in a state space. So I absolutely love that. Um, I guess on the last question, I'll have to talk to Laura and, and see what she was saying. Certainly in my results, if I feed in a transfer shock, just like the one I did in a representative agent model, nothing happens purely by Ricardian equivalence. So there, very naturally, there is a big difference. I don't know exactly the experiment that Laura had in her model, but I'm sure it's interesting to, to have that conversation. Uh, thanks, Ludovic, for the very Nice presentation. I have a very quick uh, question on the persistence of inflation. So think about the transfer shock you just mentioned. Does that imply very different conduct of monetary policy? If you think about commitment issues, right? uh, discretion versus commitment, if you face very different dynamics of inflation, does heterogeneous agent type of model imply very different uh, commitment outcomes? Yeah, that's a quick question on, on, on the result. Take it right away. Excellent. Great. 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 I think the commitment issues are most real if there is some degree of limited, uh, if there is some degree of, of, of foresight and we're not in the fully myopic world. Because in that case, exactly as you're saying, part of the stimulus that you're getting from uh, uh, fiscal transfers is going to operate because households are going to have expectations that income in the future will also go up because of that persistence, and that'll sustain some spending today. And if there is no commitment of the central bank to facilitate or, or allow for that you know, income increase in the future, then you'll shut down that channel and you'll mitigate how effective fiscal transfers are in a recession. So what the case I'm thinking about is imagine you're in a recession today, the government tries to stimulate, but we know that it's going to have, you know, an inflationary effect that outlasts the, uh, the, the recession itself. In that case, with some foresight, a, a commitment of the central bank not to undo or not to push against inflation and, and a boom in the future will aid, um, um, it will aid the, the effect of the stimulus, the multiplier in the recession. So I totally agree with you. I think it'll depend on the degree to which we you know, believe in, in, in perfect foresight. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Ludwig. This was a great uh, keynote. I have a quick question about welfare. So suppose that I write a model with, uh, say, myopic agents or bounded rationality, and in principle, I can reproduce the same M functions that you have, uh, but without uh, borrowing constraints, more like uh, people can, do not have perfect foresight or they're more myopic. 
I guess I feel like I could reproduce the impulse response of these two models, like can make them almost equal, perhaps, but welfare would be different. I wonder if you have uh, anything to say about this. Thank you. I have nothing to say about welfare. That's the, the honest truth. You're exactly right. And I think this is a feature, not a bug, that if you give me a different model that gives me the exact same M, I'm going to get exactly the same impulse responses to the ones I showed you. And the reason I think this is a feature is because it makes it very transparent how the black box, the model, operates. Because if there's something that I don't understand, all I need to understand is M. And once I understand M, I understand the impulse responses. Now, that's true in the sort of relatively simple model that I had on the slides. Once you allow for an active Taylor rule, et cetera, there's going to be a bunch more margins, such as how households respond to interest rate changes, not, not just to income changes, that are going to be relevant. But it's still a limited set of objects that I need to uh, think about when thinking about the transmission of, of policies into the economy. Um, so you're absolutely right on the positive question. On the normative question, I have, unfortunately, much less to say. I, my hunch is exactly the same as yours that for normative questions, it does matter you know, what your utility function looks like, whether you have heterogeneity or some other model that doesn't have that but still generates um, these M's. Just because Olivier is here, I wanted to mention one way to get at these slowly declining spending responses to an income transfer is actually with overlapping generations. And once you have overlapping generations and you, you, know, you know, assume mortality risk is rather high, because you don't want that they you know, spend it down over 60 years, but you want to spend it down at sort of the horizon that the, mo the, model, the agents in the heterogeneous agent model actually have, which is a couple years. In that case, you, know, you can get similar slow spending down behavior with an OLG model rather than a heterogeneous agent model. You're missing some of the distributional effects, but again, if you're interested in aggregates, maybe that's a, that's a useful starting point. Coming from uh, macrofinance, I think of the, the transmission mechanism of monetary policy as one in which central banks calm down markets when they do expansionary monetary policy and thereby reduce risk premia. And that's how they affect interest rates that are important for investment and also house purchases of households. And so I'm wondering how you think about hank models current hank models and the and and this type of transmission mechanism through risk premia is there a way to amplify the current effects or how do you think about it that's that's an excellent question i wish i had an answer that matched the question so right now most of the literature can't really speak to these issues because it's very, very hard to solve these models to higher order. And if you wanted risk premium to move around, you not just would need you know, a second order, but maybe even a third order expansion. And that is very hard to, very hard to do. Um, Martin and Ralph have, a, have an interesting paper where they have um, a sort of a workaround through ambiguity version that gets you some more action on risk premium. But if you just want to have you know, the standard aggregate risk in there with, you know, things, ingredients like uh, Epstein's in preferences to get, uh, uh, or long run risk to get risk premium up. That's going to be very hard to solve in a full blown heterogeneous agent model so far. We have some new work that's coming out soon, um, where we uh, are able to solve for steady state risk premium, but not how risk premium move in response to monetary policy. Now, having said that, I do agree. I think that is potentially a very powerful effect of monetary policy that goes beyond the effects I mentioned that already point to investment being important in the transmission mechanism. And my sense is that um, you know, risk premium moving in response to monetary policy or term premium moving um, are two you know, additional channels that, that you know, boost firm investment, boost residential investment. Thank you. Um, coming to the end of your slide about the spillovers, I was uh, very intrigued that after the U.S. stimulus, 
uh, the US pretty much quickly cools down. I mean, it almost over cools down to a dark blue. So, but at the same time, the rest of the world in Europe, they were actually still booming, so to say. So the question I have there is, why is the back channel so weak? I mean, is it because the US is running a trade deficit or is it because in the US, the back channel goes directly to this top 1% who are basically the absorbing state? So my first question is, do you have some intuition there? Um, and the second one then is, depending on your answer, the first one, would that imply that there's also some asymmetry in how the monetary policy spill over because of different trade deficits or different industry structure in the two countries? Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Um, so on the back channel, my sense is that that's just because the US may be large relative to other countries, but it's not, you know, that large relative to, to the rest of the world. And so if you start stimulus in the US, of course, it, it's going to have a large effect in the US to begin with, but then it sort of starts dissipating and it starts dissipating to the huge, you know, rest of the world, even though, you know, living in America, you know, I'm, uh, I'm used to thinking there's nothing else other than America, but there are other countries. And so once you have that, that stimulus, um, you know, uh, leaks to the rest of the world, there's a lot of spending that happens within the rest of the world or put differently if you computed sort of the home bias of all countries together that are not the us it's pretty large and so that's why and the us is also a relatively closed economy and that's why there's a lot of spending once it leaks there's a lot of spending that stays in the rest of the world that's where there's a lot of sort of momentum in spending and inflation that builds up in the rest of the world as that money uh, starts leaking out um and I will say one thing on this. Um, I was surprised how quick and how um, you know how quick that that uh, those spillovers were to the neighboring countries because I would have thought that the U.S. is a relatively, as I said, a relatively closed economy. The import share isn't that high, but still, there's su there's sufficient imports to sustain a boom in Canada and in Mexico that happens to you know be quite significant relative to the US boom. boom. So I'm, I, I was uh, quite um, you know, surprised to see that. On asymmetry in monetary policy, I think I agree with you that there is going to be some asymmetry because if you, say, start in the euro area and, and you have uh, um, um, you know, your monetary policy experiment, then there's going to be some spillover than, into the US, but the US is a large economy. And, and so it's just going to be you know, relative to the size of the economy smaller whereas if you you know have the other way around for each individual country the us can be a very large trade partner um, like canada like mexico and so you have more spillovers there um, you saw that the spillovers to germany for example they were already much milder so it's not the case that you know the us is super super important for everything that happens in in germany or in the euro area but my guess is that it runs a bit more into the you know, from the us to to Europe than maybe from Europe to the US. That would be my hunch, but I haven't, I haven't done those exact experiments. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ludwig. Uh, we are getting closer to the end, and uh, you know, I will take advantage of my position here, and I will uh, ask you the last question. If you look at the fiscal stimuli in, in Korea, uh, the fiscal stimuli consisted of two different kinds of, uh, of uh, actions. One, uh, you know, an important part of the of the of the fiscal measures were aimed at reducing the price of energy to mitigate, uh, you know, the impact on households. And another part, you know, was much more, uh, you know, trying to target the income of the of the of the low income households. Does it make any difference in terms of uh, the impact that this might have uh, according to your models and to your your analysis? Very interesting question. Let me uh, let me think about that. So, for sure, both on net are going to be transfers to household balance sheets, and so just from that perspective, they're already going to be somewhat stimulative. They're also going to play a, an important insurance role because in a world in which ener energy prices go up and and households. Uh, that are on the poor side are more exposed to that because the you know energy share and their consumption is higher. So I think in that case, um, probably you'll find a better insurance role of the 
you know, subsidies to energy consumption than, uh, than sort of a pure income transfer. Um, now, how you deal, how you design the subsidies, I think was a bit different across countries. And I think there much care has to be, uh, has to be taken, whether that's a, a lump sum subsidy or a lump sum insurance payment that depends on maybe energy consumption over some past billing cycle, or is it just a pure cap on energy prices as some European countries have introduced it, in which case there's less of a substitution mechanism that is active. And in fact, if you're thinking of you know, a common, let's say, natural gas market in, the, in, in, the Euro, um, in, in Europe, then there's sort of a bit of a beggar thy neighbor you know, dynamic that can, be, uh, uh, come, uh, that can come from a pure subsidy to energy prices, because if I get energy more cheaply, then I do less substitution, and so you're going to have to do more substitution. So I think that's probably going to be the most important, um, most, most important effect. And I think the only, yeah, the only other thing that I can think of is that a, a, a pure subsidy shows up in inflation differently. So if you're really interested in keeping inflation down for a couple of months, then that subsidy is, is probably more useful for that, just because headline inflation will be lower. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, Lotte. Thank you very much for the presentation.